make it work. Good morning, church. What a beautiful day the Lord has given us. Would you stand as we get ready to worship this morning? Let's just cry out to him and let him know how good he is to us.
praise this morning?
eternal life because he rose again. And so it makes it awfully easy for me to show up early on a Sunday morning and say hallelujah. You want to say it? Just say hallelujah. Hallelujah. You can be seated. You can be seated. We're going to have the Lord's Supper here in just a moment. And here's something that I enjoy about our time of sharing in the bread and the cup. 2,000 years have passed since that evening in the upper room and since Jesus established what we call the Lord's Supper. It's been 2,000 years. And guess what? Nothing has changed. Nothing has changed. I I'm so glad that by faith, we still do it the way that Jesus taught us how to do it. I, I'm thankful that we still take the bread in our hands knowing that it represents His body. I, I'm thankful that when we hold that piece of bread, it reminds us of His brokenness, not ours. It was His body that was broken. It was His body that was beaten. It was His body that was bruised. And the Bible says that by His stripes, I'm healed. I want you to know that when you hold this bread here in a few moments, you need to remember that, Christian. His body was broken so that you could be healed. That's the Word of God. And don't let anybody take it from you. Don't let anybody rob you of the fullness of your faith in what He accomplished by allowing His body to be the sacrifice on your behalf. You hold on to that bread and you put your faith in Christ knowing that you're holding the symbol of what He did for you. We still share in the cup. The Bible says that Jesus took the cup and when He gave it to them, He said, this is the blood of a new covenant. Jesus says, I'm creating something. I'm making something. I'm establishing something that's never been up until that very night and up until the next day when it followed that he would be crucified and shed his blood. Up until then, man relied upon the sacrifices that were offered to God from themselves. They had to bring the sacrifice, but this time God brought the sacrifice. They had to allow their animals to be the offering, but this time God said, it'll be my son that's going to be the offering. They, they had to watch the blood of those sacrifices be poured out. But God watched as His Son shed His blood on our behalf. He said, this is a new covenant. Do you know what that means? This is a new way of you to know God. This is a, a new way for you to have a relationship with the Father. And it's the same covenant that you and I have today. It's still a new covenant. It's still a better covenant. It's still the only covenant that's going to get you into the presence of God. It's the only covenant that's going to guarantee you forgiveness of your sin. It's the only covenant that's going to give you an eternity with the Father. It's the only covenant that is going to bring a seal in your spirit that you belong to Him. It's the only covenant that works, and it's ours. Amen? It's our covenant that we have received through faith in Christ. And that's the key to taking communion. It's done by faith. You're, you're not working. You're not doing. You're receiving. You're not adding to. You're not bringing anything with you. You're accepting what's been given to you. And faith is what does the receiving. In a few moments, you're going to stand from your feet, Christian. You're going to come down this aisle and you're going to receive this bread in this cup. And I want you to know, you ought not miss the opportunity that's provided to you right here. Don't you dare go through the motions. Listen, his body was too precious. His blood is too priceless for you to go through the motions. His sacrifice was too great for you to go through the motions. Don't do it. You come down here and you, as Jesus instructed us, you remember him. You remember what he did. Now, two things are going to happen or ought to happen when the people of God take the Lord's Supper. Number one, before we take it, we have to spend a moment in reflection. And then number two, while we're taking it, we have to spend a moment in celebration. 
I need to reflect, why did Jesus have to do this for me? I need to be reminded of what I had done that took him to the cross. I, I need to be honest about my sin, not your sin, but my sin that needed a sacrifice so that it could be forgiven. I need to be mindful that I could have never made that sacrifice on my own. It would have never been good enough. I could have never gotten myself salvation. It took the blood of God's only son. And I need to reflect on that. And in that reflection, I need to take it as an opportunity to repent as well. I need to be willing to say, Lord, even recently, what I've done had to be covered by the blood. What I've done, Jesus had to make a payment for it so that I could be cleansed and forgiven. And you need to get in alignment with God this morning. Some of y'all, you need a refreshing. I understand that. I need it too. You need a refreshing. And, I, and I'm not talking about a shot in the arm. I'm talking about a washing within. You, you, you need to experience the grace of God to its fullest extent. And you need to allow this moment to be a part of bringing that into your life. When we celebrate, it's not that we do it with a certain volume. It's not that we try and register so loud that it gets to heaven. It's that our hearts leap within us. It, it can certainly be audible. But I'm telling you, there should be some joy in your celebration. There should be some thankfulness in your partaking of the bread and the cup. Don't miss this opportunity. I want to ask you to bow your heads. And we're going to reflect for a moment. Let's go back to the cross. You see the cross empty. There's no one there. Man's sins, your sins, stand in full account before God, a righteous and holy judge. And he must pour out judgment. He must pour out wrath. And because the cross is empty, that wrath will be poured out upon you. The guilty party. The one who committed the offense. You stand before a holy God, guilty, with an empty cross. But then you hear a voice. I'll go. I'll take their place on the cross. I'll take their judgment upon myself. I'll pay their debt and I will pay it in full. And so the perfect Lamb of God takes your place. Thank Him for it. He was not a sacrifice for some of your sin or for most of your sin, but for all of it. He was a sacrifice for the things that only you and God know about, for the things done in darkness the things done in secret. He was a sacrifice for that sin. He was a sacrifice for every act of your rebellion. Every wrong word spoken. Every time that you disobeyed. He's a sacrifice for that sin. Now 
now you see the Son of God on the cross. And there's no worse way to die known by men than through the crucifixion. Slow, agonizing, horrible death. And a perfect man who is also perfect God took the suffering. Can you see him in his agony? Can you see him in his pain? He cries out. He weeps. His chest heaves as he struggles to get the next breath. And the blood runs constant. The wounds are so severe, his body cannot clot. It only pours. from his hands it runs down that cross from his feet and from the top of his head where a crown of thorns has been thrust upon him to the nails that are holding his feet he bleeds our sins that put him there. We were deserving of the punishment and judgment, but he would not allow it. He took it for us. Six hours later, With his final breath, he declares, it's finished. What was finished? The requirement for sin. It was over. The judgment of God, it had all been poured out. The sacrifice had been fully and perfectly made. The Bible says, and he breathed his last and he died. Now, see the cross where the Son of God hangs lifeless, motionless. He gave it all. Every ounce of life in his body, he gave it all. He held nothing back. And he did it for you. Oh, how undeserving we are. And how oftentimes, how ungrateful we are. In your reflection this morning, Christian, be grateful. Tell him with a heart full of faith, thank you, Jesus. By your stripes, I am healed. Tell him that, Christian. Thank you that you have given me victory. I am an overcomer through the blood of the Lamb and the word of my testimony that you've given me. That I have put my faith in the way that you have made. I have put my faith solely in your sacrifice for my sin. I can do nothing. You have done everything. 
I've just accepted it. Come into agreement with God this morning. Father, this is what it took so that you might gain my freedom, so that you might cleanse me of all unrighteousness, so that you might forgive me of every offense. I agree with you, Father. It had to happen so that I could be forgiven. And knowing the seriousness of my sin, I seek to rid my life of it from this moment forward. I have no interest in partaking of the things that put your son on the cross. I have no interest in living a life that he died to free me of. I want to honor his sacrifice. I want to honor his death with my living. This is the moment, Christian, for you to personally confess to God anything that you believe stands in the way of your honoring his sacrifice confess it to the Lord the Bible commands us to flee from that which is evil come into agreement with God and call it evil call it sin and reject it from your life allow the Holy Spirit to bring conviction to you even now and show you what you need to confess before a holy God as you prepare to take this supper. From anger to impatience to lust and greed, to laziness and selfishness and jealousy and envy, sexual immorality, hatred, division, apathy, Confess it to the Lord. Disobedience, unthankfulness, entitlement. Confess it to the Lord. Worry, anxiety, and stress. Confess it to the Lord. the Bible says if the Son has set you free you are free indeed walk in your Christ provided God ordained freedom because it took the cross to give it to you hold on to the freedom that you have been given by a holy father hold on to what he has accomplished and declared done in your life hold on to every drop of grace that you have received hold on to it and let everything else go let it go As I begin to pray in just a moment, I'd like to ask our deacons, Chris and Tim, come make your way up here. And folks, we're going to pray together as they come. Father, we agree with you today that it had to be done. 
Your holiness demanded a sacrifice, a payment for sin. You could not open heaven's gates and allow anybody to come in just because they wanted to be there. Sin and unrighteousness could never be allowed into your direct presence. But yet you wanted company. You wanted people made in your image to be able to live forever with you. And so while your holiness demanded a sacrifice, your mercy gave the sacrifice. The only suitable one, your son. Thank you for this great demonstration of love. How could we doubt your love when you gave your very best for us? And so as we come forward and as we accept this bread and as we take this cup, we remember the sacrifice of our Lord Jesus. We remember his death. We remember his blood. And Jesus, we say thank you. Thank you for making a way for us. I want to ask you to stand to your feet. Before you come forward, I need to remind you of something that the scriptures tell us. This bread and this cup is not for everybody. It's for those who have accepted Christ. We will not make a mockery of his body and blood. If you have put your faith in Jesus Christ as Lord, if you've accepted the sacrifice that he made on your behalf, if you've become a follower of Christ, then here in a moment I want you to come forward and receive this. But if you have not, I'm asking you, while you're waiting, consider why you're waiting. Why would you not accept something so freely offered, yet totally undeserved? And I'm telling you, according to the scriptures, Today can be the day of your salvation. Today can be the day when you, by faith, take the real blood and the real body, not its symbols. Today can be the day that you put your faith in Jesus alone, knowing that he died for you and rose again on the third day. There's nothing and no one stopping you from putting your faith in Christ. It's just you. The Bible says that salvation is a gift. That means God makes it available. You can receive it. But at any point during this service, at any point after this service, you'd like to talk with us about accepting Christ. We're here. We'd love to help you walk through your putting your faith in Him. For everyone else, as you come down, the temptation is going to be for you to talk and chit-chat. I'm asking you not to do that. We're, we're a vibrant, lively church. I get it. But there are certain times when we just need to put our direct and total attention upon the Lord. And this is one of those times. And so as you come down, I'm asking you to, if you're going to talk, talk to Jesus. Tell him how wonderful he is and how, how much you love him and how thankful you are for what he's done. And let's really honor him with this time. For those that haven't had the Lord's Supper with us before, we use these center aisles to come down. You'll receive the bread in the cup and then we use the outside aisles to go back and you can get back to your seats. It's usually easiest if folks here in the center section just kind of go both ways. 
so that it evens up the lines. We're not in a hurry. We're not going to rush. That's why we've begun doing this earlier in our service over the last several months. Because we're not just trying to add this in at the end. If this is all we did today, it would be good. If this is all we did, God would be honored. Amen? Amen. Amen. So by faith, Christian, come forward.
Let's stand to our feet together, please. You know, Christ was born for one reason. He, he took on flesh for one purpose, and that's to come and live a perfect life and die for each one of us, to lay down that body. The only one who was able to walk without sin. And so, like Pastor David said, we need to remember and we need to reflect, but we also need to rejoice because of what he's done for us. It's kind of strange, or not strange, but he compared himself to the, he said, I am the bread of life. And back in those days, bread was essential to the diet. Christ is essential to our salvation. Without him, there is none. He is the bread of life. He gives the eternal life. And the Bible says that he took some bread and gave thanks to God for it. And he broke it into pieces. And he gave it to the disciples saying, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. It's all for time. Apostle Paul writes in Ephesians 1 7 that he, Jesus, is so rich in kindness and grace that he purchased our freedom with the blood of his son and forgave us our sins. And the Lord Jesus said that this cup that we are about to take. Is the New Testament in my blood is my blood that was shed for you. And as often as you do it, do this in remembrance. as a showing of your appreciation for what Jesus has done for you, and as a way to tell the Lord who sits upon a throne in heaven at the right hand of the Father how thankful you are. While we're standing, I think it makes perfect sense for us to give him a round of applause. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Well, we do have something worth celebrating, don't we, Christian? Oh, my. We've got eternity to celebrate. And so uh, I want to ask you, the, the choir's going to come up, and while they're coming up, spend the next minute or so celebrating with one another, encouraging one another, shaking hands with one another. Choir, praise team, come on up.
I'm going to tell you what, the men were holding it down up here. I am who I am because the I am. Let me hear it, men, just a minute. Ready? I am who I am because the I am tells me. That's decent. Let's do it again, please, men. I want you to sing. I can hear a few. Now, I want to hear all these men. Ready? And I am. Oh, do it again, man. Come on. All right, that's good. Now, ladies, you give him a little pop and say, good job, baby. Good job. Hey, men, I, I tell you what, you know who you are because he's told you who you are. 
He's, he's told you what he's done. And you belong to him. And you've got a new name, ladies. You know who you are because he has told you who you are. And on top of that, he has made you who you are. And you've got a new name written in glory. I'm thankful for that. I'm thankful. Praise the Lord. Folks, we've had, we've had a great service so far today. I just want to thank the Lord for what he's done so far. We sang it early on that he'll fill up a place where he's worshipped. He inhabits a place where he's wanted. Amen? Anybody want Jesus to fill up the place today? I know that I do. Here's the thing. He knows. He knows where he's wanted. He knows who wants him. He knows who shows up on a Sunday and says, God, meet with us. God, be here because if you're not here, what's the point? And I'm going to tell you what. He's been honored in this place, and he's meeting with his people. I'm thankful for that. Turn to Hebrews chapter 13. You got your Bible ready? Hey, this right here will tell you who you are. It'll tell you who the Lord is. tell you who you are. The Bible is God's Word. It has authority in my life. The Bible changes me. I don't change the Bible. We're going to read these two verses out of Hebrews 13, verses 20 and 21. This is what the Bible says. Now may the God of peace, who brought up from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, and ratified an eternal covenant with his blood, may he equip you with all you need for doing his will. May he produce in you, through the power of Jesus Christ, every good thing, that is pleasing to him. All glory to him forever and ever. Amen. Can you say amen? Amen. You can be seated. These two verses that we've read are portions of a prayer that the writer of Hebrews offers to the reader of the letter. This, this prayer is not just for the readers who read it right after it was written, but also it's for the readers who might read it 2,000 and some odd years later, like me and you. And you see, God through the Holy Spirit inspires the writer so that the writer prays the way God wants. I want you to know this is not a, a man-informed prayer. This is a God-informed prayer. God gave the information, here's how you need to pray for my people. Here's how you need to pray on their behalf. And then he writes it down. Not only does he pray it, but he writes it down as well. And he says in verse 20, go back to verse 20. He says, now may the God of peace, I want you to know this prayer is about God, not you. Listen, real, effective, God-informed prayer is about God first. And then it blesses and benefits God's people. But the prayer's got to be about God. My prayers can't be about me. All right? Now may the God of peace who brought up from the dead our Lord Jesus. Now the writer is going to remind the people in the prayer of what God has done and then what he wants to do next. He brought from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep. And he ratified an eternal covenant with his blood. In other words, God has already done so much for the one who would accept it. God has already raised up the head of the church. God has already given life to the head of the church. God has already declared victory for the people who would trust in God. And he did it by way of sacrifice through the blood of his son. Now verse 21. It says, may he, may God, the one who's already done such great things, may he equip you. God wants you to be equipped, and God knows that he's the one that must equip you. You cannot equip yourself. The only benefit that I have or any other preacher has in equipping the saints is if God is informing us through the scriptures. I can't equip you apart from God's word. So God is doing the equipping. It says, may he equip you with all you need. 
I want you to know something. God is interested in equipping you with all you need. You don't have to doubt it because this is a God-informed and inspired prayer that is in the Word of God for the people of God. God wants you equipped with all that you need, but here's, here's the hinge. Here's the why for doing His will. God is not looking to equip you to do your will. God is not looking to provide all your needs so that you can do what you want. God wants to equip you with all that you need so that you can do what He wants. In other words, God's got something that He wants you to do, and He also has the things, the resources that you're going to need in order to be able to do it. Then it says, may He produce in you. God is equipping. God is providing. And God is producing. May He produce in you through the power of Jesus Christ. In other words, the agent through which God works is His Son. Everything that you and I received from God came through His Son. Now, it comes by way of the presence of His Spirit. But I want you to know that something had to happen in between God the Father and God the Spirit, and that was that God the Son had to make a way. And so it says, May He produce in you through the power of Jesus Christ every good thing that is pleasing to Him. His will pleases Him. When His people do His will, it pleases Him. And then, of course, the prayer ends with all glory to Him forever and ever. Amen. I, I want to get you on the train this morning, Christian. On the will train. God's will. I, I want you to get on board because you've got to make a decision as to which train you're going to ride. You, you can ride the train of your will, or you can ride the train of God's will, but I want you to know it's not the same train. Now, your will can become God's will after you get on God's train, but your will will never be God's will before it gets on God's train. you you got to let God lead the way, and then He changes your heart, and He equips you, and then He gives you desires that honor Him. And so you, you need to know what God's will is for your life. As a matter of fact, you're obligated to do it because God says, I equip when you want to do my will. I provide the needs when you have a desire in your heart to do my will. God is under no obligation to equip or bless somebody that does not want to follow him. Even Listen, even a saved son and daughter. God is under no obligation to to provide for something that's going to take you further from what he wants. He's under no obligation to do that. But he puts himself under obligation to provide for you, to provide the need, and to equip the person who wants to fulfill his will. God obligates himself. You can't make him do it. He says, I will do it. If you want what I want, God says, then I will give you the means to make it happen. If you are interested in where I want to take you, I will guarantee you the ride. I will guarantee you the resources to get what I want done in your life. And the end result is going to be that the Father is pleased, but that through you He is glorified. We, we think about God's will as being something that, that we just want so that we know we're doing the right thing. But I'm telling you that the result of doing God's will is much grander than this. The result of doing God's will is not only that you do feel good about being obedient. Praise the Lord. you got joy for knowing that you're walking in His path of righteousness for your life. Yes, that's good. But even better is that you get to be a part of bringing God greater glory. And why would you not want to do that? Your life can bring Him glory. That's the opportunity that you have. Now, we're not trying to repay God back for anything. But the Bible says that we ought to live in a particular way because we know how much He's done for us. I ought to have a want to inside of me that wants to do His will. The question then becomes, how do I know what God's will is for my life? How do I know which way the train is moving? 
How do I know what he's wanting me to accomplish? Those are the questions that Christians ought to be asking. Not how can I get God to head where I want to go, but how can I find out where he's going so that I can get on board? How can I make sure that I'm right where he wants me to be? And so this week and next week, I'm going to preach a two-part series called Living Where It Counts. You need to live where it counts. There's a lot of people that aren't living where it counts. They're living, but it's not counting for anything. It's kind of like revving up your engine in neutral. The engine's getting the workout. The engine is having to turn those RPMs. The, the engine is producing energy, but it's not accomplishing anything because it's sitting still. A lot of people are living that way. Oh, they're busy. They got a lot going on. They, they may seem successful by other people's standards and through other people's eyes, but they're not living where it counts. And here's where it counts. It only counts if it's for the king and the kingdom. It only counts if it's for the king and the kingdom. If it's benefiting everybody else but God, it doesn't count to God. If it's blessing others but not blessing God, it doesn't count to God. There's all kinds of people doing good things but not for the Lord. There's all kinds of people doing noble things, but they're doing it for themselves or, or for their own self-fulfillment or so that they might be applauded. And God says, doesn't count. You've got to do it for me. It's my will we're trying to get accomplished here. Not yours. God says, it's my will. I want to live where it counts, don't you? I, I want to get in a position, and here's the thing. I am responsible for getting myself in that position. I want to get in a position where what I do makes a difference, where what I do honors the Lord, where what I do pleases the Father, where what I do glorifies God. I want to get in that position, and I have to put myself in that position by faith. I have to put myself in that position. God will not make me do it, but once I put myself in that position, God says, I'll provide. I'll equip, and I'll use you. But you are responsible for getting in that position because that's where it counts. Life's pretty short. Make it count. Live in such a way that it matters. And the only way to do that is to be in God's will. That's how you know that it counts is if it's his will now it might be big things but it could be small things God, God's will is exhaustive God doesn't just have a, a will for how you make money God doesn't just have a will for what town you live in God doesn't just have a will for what church you go to God has a will for all them days in between God has a will for every relationship that you have God has a will for every opportunity that you have. God, God has a will for every conversation that you have. God has a will for that. And isn't it wonderful to know that He is so intricately interested in you? He's, he's not just trying to get the big showy stuff out of you, just, the, just kind of the heavy hitter subjects. He, he's trying to get even the smaller things lined up in your life with His heart. He has a will for that. So I'm going to share with you four important steps so that you can know God's will for your life. I'm going to share with you two today and two next time. Number one, the first step that you can take so that you might know God's will for your life. Number one, you have to read the Word. Now here's what happens when such a simple statement is made in church. Everybody says, I knew that. Of course. But then if I asked the same people who said, I knew that, are you doing that? A decent portion of them would say, well, no. That's why we have so many Christians who are struggling. You, you know what you're supposed to do. I, I, I'm not here to reveal a new mystery to you. I'm not here to uncover a new truth and say, here's something that God just showed me that you never knew. I, I'm here to remind you of what God has already told you. I'm here to reinforce the truth of God's Word in your life. That's what I'm here for. 
And so it doesn't really matter if you already knew this. What matters is if you are doing this. You can know a lot of things and never put it to good use. And there's a lot of Christians that know a lot about what I ought to do, but are they doing those things so that it is actually impacting the trajectory of their lives? Christian, it's not enough to know you should read the Word. It only counts when you do. When you read the Word. It can't just be Sunday morning, y'all. It can't just be one time a week. You got to dig in. You got to find out what is God's will for this. How do I know what God's will is for me in this particular situation? I got to get in the Word. I ought not just take it for granted. I ought to get in the Word. What about a relationship? The world is saying it's fine if you do this. Well, what does God say? We've got a lot of professing Christians who are living ungodly lifestyles because someone told them it was okay or even another Christian told them it was okay or even, God forbid, another preacher told them it was okay but it wasn't what God said was okay. If you want to be in God's will, you've got to read God's Word. You have got to be in the Word. You've got to be receptive to the Word. You've got to want the Word to dominate, to inform, to guide your life. A lot of Christians don't get in the Word because they already know what it says. And they don't like it. They know what it's going to tell them. They, they know that it's going to tell them, this is what you need to do. But then there's a part of them, the Bible calls the flesh, our, our, our sinful nature. There's a part of us that says, mm, but I want to do this instead. Well, Christian, only, only in doing what the Word says will it count. It only counts when you do it God's way. You cannot be in God's will and living in contradiction to God's Word. There's no way that I can justify saying that I'm in God's will if there's Scripture that you could clearly show me that says, yeah, but it says this, and you're doing that, right? You've got to get in the Word. Listen to what the Bible says here in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13. Therefore, we never stop thanking God that when you received His message from us, you did not think of our words as mere human ideas. You accepted what we said as the very Word of God, which of course it is. And this Word, are you ready? And this Word, the Word of God that they had received through the Apostle Paul, and this Word continues to work in you who believe. Paul says, I commend you for accepting what I said for what it truly is. Not a human idea. Not advice from the apostle. But the word of God, spoken by God, through the Holy Spirit out of my mouth. That's why we canonize the letters that this man wrote. Because we recognize today that what he was telling the Christians was not just his take on things, but was the Word of God. God was speaking through that man. Paul says, I'm glad that you took my word for what it truly was. Because when you do, it will continue to work in you. Because you believe it. You see, you go to God's Word, and it begins to do a work. If I want to know God's will, I've got to get in God's Word so that it can, it can begin to do the work. God's Word will work in your life. I promise. It'll work in your life. But you have got to read it. You've got to consume it. You've got to accept it. You've got to receive it. You've got to let it take. You've got to let it grow some roots. And you've got to let it begin to bear some fruit in your life. It may not happen all at one time. But it will continue to work. And what does that mean? You may not be in God's will in certain areas of your life right now. I don't think any of us are totally in God's will in every area of our life. I'm not. Can I say that? I'll just be honest with you. I know there are areas of my life that are not in, will, in God's will. 
Sure, it's, that's got to be the case because I ain't perfect. My wife can attest to that. All right? I can admit that, but here's, here's the thing. You ready? Am I willing to get in God's Word so that it might work in my life so that that might change? Am I willing to let God's Word work in me to the point that different areas of my life begin to shift and come into alignment with His will? I was a young man. Before I got ordained, I was, I was uh, 21 when I got ordained in the ministry. I was a young, I was, I was a young guy. The, the couple of years leading up to that, a dramatic transformation took place in my life. I'm, I'm talking about like a black and white kind of transformation, okay? I, I, I literally, I'm telling you something. I became a different person. That's all I can say. I had gotten saved September 27, 1995. I was 11 years old. I had gotten saved. I would never really been discipled. I would never taken ownership of my faith. I had gotten saved. I knew I was saved. Well, I could, tell, I could remember it like it happened five seconds ago. I, 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 I never had to really doubt with my salvation because it's so vivid in my mind it's seared in my mind it, something clicked on that day something happened on that day but but there wasn't a lot of fruit that was produced after that because I I really didn't know what I was supposed to do but that changed a few years later and for the very first time I took ownership and responsibility for my own faith and I opened up God's word on my own I didn't worry about some Sunday school teacher telling me, although I'm thankful for Sunday school teachers. I didn't worry about a preacher telling me, although I've had some wonderful preachers influence me and preach to me throughout my life. But what I did was I set aside some time to get in God's Word on my own, and something started to happen in me. That's, I mean, I, I can take zero credit for it. I promise you. God knows I take zero credit for it because God's Word began to change my life. It began to soak into me, and it wasn't that it always felt good, but something was working in my life. And so many areas of my life were out of alignment with God's will. And guess what? One by one, they started coming in. One by one, I got off of that train and got onto this train. One, one area, one subject, one relationship at a time got lined up with His will. Now, how did that happen? Did I go to church more? No, I was going to church. Did I participate participate more? I, I, I was pretty involved. Maybe I got a little more involved. What was really the difference? God's Word. I'm telling you, Christian, if you are unsettled with where you're at right now, if there are some, some trajectories in certain areas of your life that you are unsettled with, you're like, I just don't think this is right. I just don't think this is where I'm supposed to be. I just don't think this is how this is supposed to be going. No matter what the area is, no matter what it is, I'm telling you, if you will open up God's Word and start reading it, don't try and read it all at once. Open up. Go like the Gospels. And just read what Jesus said. Go, go to Romans and just read about the faith that you have and what it means for your life. And let God begin to transform those areas. Get in God's Word. If you want to be in God's will, if you want to live where it counts, you've got to read the Word. The second thing that you need to do, I'm going to tell you about next week, and I'll do three of them next time. Because I just saw what time it was. Bless God, I'm glad I got that much done. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. How many of y'all want to be in God's will? Yeah. All right, let's stand to our feet. I want to pray about that with you. Lord, how could we answer any other way? How, how could someone born again just openly, blatantly say, I don't want to be in God's will? But Lord, at the same time, we can be honest and say, even though I know I'm supposed to be in God's will, I can admit that there are areas of my life that are not. Lord, that's what I'm praying about and that's who I'm praying for. We, we want to be a people whose lives are counting towards something. I, I don't want to spend my life in neutral. 
I don't want to be here, yet have no effect. I, I want to get myself in a position where I can be used and where I can know that what I'm doing matters, and it matters to you, Lord. And I pray that for my brothers and sisters in Christ who are here today. Lord, I genuinely believe that they mean it when they say, yes, I want to be in God's will. Lord, help us to take these simple yet powerful steps so that one issue, one relationship, one decision at a time, we can know that we're doing what you want and not what we want. Lord, specifically, we've covered the importance of your word. I need to be in your word more than I am. I need to spend more time in your word, not just preparing to preach, but just letting you prepare me. And I know that others here feel the same. Lord, might there be a rededication in our lives to your word. Might, might we be compelled to pick it up instead of our phones. Might, might we be convicted of the time that we are spending doing something else when we should be spending it with you in your word. Because your word, unlike anything else, when it takes, it continues to do a good work. And that's what we want. We want you to do a good work in and through our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, good service today, y'all. I tell you what, I, it was so good, I'd just about turn around an hour or so and do it again. Let's bless each other on the way out. All kinds of good things happening. <laughs> Read your bulletin, all right? A lot of wonderful things you need to know about. That's why we give it to you. You ready? I don't know, that didn't sound too good. Are you ready? You're gonna listen, you're going to bless them. You're going to bless them right into Sunday school. You're going to bless them right into God's Word with other people, right? You're not going to bless them out into the parking lot, are you? If you do go to the parking lot, you're still blessed. I want you to know we're blessing you. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make His face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn His face toward you and give you peace.